Dennis Hansel couldn't make it today. And so he asked me to step in. So I just wanted to welcome everybody. Um, loved reading the, the newsletter this week, especially the, the, the Saving the Fishermen, um, the RV Oceanus. So that was wonderful. I think being a new Mainer three and a half years ago, the loss of fishermen is, I think, on my mind more than when I lived in Virginia. So that was really wonderful to read. So welcome everybody. And now I'm just gonna toss it over to Doug Russell, who will be our master of ceremonies for the rest of the uh, meeting today. Take it away, Thanks, Doug. Deb. Thanks, Deb. I greatly appreciate you stepping in today. And we are really looking forward to when you take over as the chair after Dennis is done. So um, this, is, this is a nice warm up for you. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. I am having technical issues, so I'm doing this off my phone, but we're, we're all good. So today we're focusing on agency reports. Uh, I guess first I'll start with any lingering questions from last week's talk. We'll quickly get an answer before we dive into these. Um, I don't know, hopefully there's not much, I hope we covered it all. And uh, the, we will be posting the, uh, the video streams, the links to the video streams from last thir last Wednesday's talk, and we'll get the presentation up on the uh, website too. Uh, today we'll start with the uh, presentations from the four agencies. So I guess we'll get started. Uh, Bob Hauptman is going to talk and uh, give us an update from National Science Foundation. Um, no slides, so Bob's just going to be talking to us. With that, Bob, please take it away. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Hi, everyone. I'd like to start out just by echoing some of Dennis's comments from uh, the first session on the great work that's been done by the UNAL's office and uh, the entire stakeholders team. The amount of work that was safely executed both ashore and at sea is, in my mind, a truly impressive. And it's a direct reflection of uh, the collaborative nature of the UNALS community that, as we all know, now started uh, 50 years ago, and it's very evident uh, here again today. I'll give a brief update on just a few of the topics from uh, the NSF perspective. First, just a few comments on the personnel side of things. By now, you've likely all seen that uh, Dr. Fleming Krem who served as the chief operating officer for NSF uh, has retired. And Dr. Karen Marangeli is now assuming those responsibilities as a critical member of Dr. Ponch's NSF leadership team. And uh, also in the director's office, Dr. Jim Olvestad, who uh, served as the chief officer for research facilities is retiring. And Dr. Linnea Avalon, who is taking over this position, she has served most recently as the senior advisor for facilities in the geo directorate. So, uh, and, and we're very pleased to have Dr. Shelby Walker now back to NSF. She is assuming these duties as the senior advisor for facilities in the geo directorate. I may have mentioned at the, at the last meeting that Dr. Bill Easterling's tour of duty as the assistant director for geosciences has ended and uh, he returned to his home institution of Penn State. And at that time, Dr. Alex Isern, who I think everyone knows, uh, she served in various positions in NSF over more than 20 years, was the acting AD, but Alex has now taken over as the permanent AD. So uh, you'll be seeing and hearing a lot from Alex. And then uh, moving a little bit further down, the, the leadership chain, Terry Quinn's IPA appointment as the division director for ocean sciences is coming to a close in mid 2022. And the whole process of getting people on board is kind of lengthy. So that recruiting and replacement process is already well underway. 
NSF is recruiting for quite a few positions. If you look at uh, uh, at the uh, jobs uh, USA Jobs site, you're going to see uh, quite a few positions for NSF, and I won't talk about them. But I do, will just mention one more, which is uh, OCE has an ad out for a full-time permanent program director to oversee the Ocean Observatories Initiative. This is near and dear to my heart, of course, because I've been doing that job for a while. And so that recruitment is on USA Jobs and it closes on the 25th of October. If you know anyone that might be interested, please point them to USA Jobs. Just a couple of words about the budget picture, as has been the norm for quite a few years now. Guess what? We're in a continuing resolution. This CR goes to the 3rd of December. And as I've said in the past, under a continuing resolution, NSF gets an allocation of funding that's based on the length of the CR and also on the previous budget year. So, uh, NSF and this, the Geo Directorate has received an allocation and it's been distributed to the various divisions and offices. And the focus here, of course, is to keep things moving while the actual FY22 budget issues get resolved. Now, one thing that uh, is of interest for the academic research fleet, the UNL's community is that NSF leadership requires that we ensure the major facilities have at least three months worth of funding available in order to keep things moving in the event of a lapse in appropriations. So as part of the closeout for FY21, we provided the major facilities with three months worth of forward funding. And, and we're gonna be doing the same thing as we now are potentially looking at uh, an extension to the CR. So from that perspective, we should be able to keep activities moving forward, awards being made and facilities being operated. As far as the eventual FY22 budget goes, you likely know as much as we do as everyone reads and stays up on the news. FY21 was actually a good budget year, thanks in part to an addition of funding focused on COVID relief and the American Rescue Plan. Now for FY22, the president's budget is requesting an NSF top line of 10.1 billion. Now this is an increase of 1.7 billion or 19% over the FY21 actual enacted budget. In this 10.1 billion, there is 864 million that is designated for the establishment of a new directorate called Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships. So uh, because that's a new start, nothing actually can really get started on that until there is an actual FY22 budget. But that is, if, assuming that that budget level comes through, then some level of funding to the TIP director, directorate is what's expected. Now for the GEO Directorate, uh, the president's budget is requesting 1.2 billion, which is 109 million, 190 million over the 21 level. And again, that's about 19%. And then looking a little closer to the division that most is involved in the UNOS community, which is Ocean Sciences. The request is for 476 million, which is a $73 million or an 18% increase over FY21. So those are all pretty healthy numbers. And as is usually the case, as you can see in the news, there are ongoing discussions you know, on not only a reconciliation bill, but an infrastructure bill 
And there's also this small issue of uh, the debt ceiling that needs to be worked. So needless to say, at this point in time, we don't know what the actual FY22 budget will be, but we're continuing to work and uh, we're pressing on with the many programs and projects that we have, have ongoing. So uh, finally, I'll let you know that uh, just from an NSF staffing perspective, we're still in a maximum teleworking mode. So that means that no more than 25% occupancy in the HQ building and no panels and no meetings in the building, at least through the end of the calendar year. We don't know how much further or what's going to happen beyond that. But right now, 25% occupancy maximum, maximum teleworking and no meetings or panels in the building, at least through the end of the calendar year. OK, I've gone on for a bit now. I'm going to go ahead and stop there and turn it back over to Doug. Thanks, Bob. Uh, anybody have any questions for Bob? I would appreciate that update. Okay, great. I appreciate Thanks very much. And so we'll go ahead and kick it over to Rob Spirit for an update from the Office of Naval Research. I've got a presentation for Rob. Ms. Rob. Great. Okay, can everyone see that? Looks like it. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Alice. Is Rob here? I thought I saw him. I didn't see him. I looked, but I might have missed him. I was just on the phone with him and he said he was coming. Shall we go to the next? Should we go to the NOAA report and uh, come back sure. to Rob? Yeah, I want to do that and I'll, I'll text Rob. Thanks. Mike. Claire, are you here? Oh, Claire can't get here till later either. Okay, State Department. <laughs> are you all here? We are. Awesome. And you guys are ready to go? That would be great. Yes. Are you going to share our PowerPoint? I will do that, yes. Uh, Bruce Applegate, you also have your hand raised, I noticed. I had a question for Bob Houtman while we're getting that sorted out. Sure, go ahead, Bruce, thanks. Sure. Hey, folks. Um, yeah, question for Bob. Um, sure. Is there uh, an update on NSF travel for things like ship inspections? And NSF, also, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. And, I, and, a, and an unrelated question. I was just interested in knowing whether there are any forthcoming personnel changes envisioned within integrative programs. Thank you. Yep. No problem, Bruce. Uh, for the travel perspective, yes, uh, the travel policy has been adjusted. If you're fully vaccinated, then uh, you can travel as mission uh, requirements call for. And if you are unvaccinated, then you are not allowed to travel other than it has to be mission critical. So yes, we are looking at the opportunity to restart ship inspections, <clears throat> Bruce, the factor that's involved there ends up being clearly understanding what are the COVID 
protocol requirements uh, in place by the institutions, by the ship operators that will in fact have ship inspections. So I need to understand very clearly <clears throat> what kind of uh, requirements are going to be needed. And I've been working and starting to work with Doug Russell to uh, determine what all of those are. Uh, let's see, changes in personnel at this point in time in the integrative programs section. We are, as I mentioned, we're recruiting for a OOI program director. We also had a recruitment which has closed now for a program, uh, a science analyst, which is a next level up from a science assistant for the IPS section. And let's see, uh, we are in the process of developing a recruitment for a ship inspection program director, but that's, uh, that's it for the current status, Bruce. Uh, good afternoon, Rob here, checking to see if I'm still muted. You're not, nope. Rob. We can hear you. Um, I've got the State Department queued up. Do you think you could go after the State Department report? We don't mind sure. if he goes first. It's okay. So let's go ahead and do the State Department since you're up and running. All right. Sounds good. Thanks again. Um, so we have part of our team here today to give you an update on the marine scientific research uh, diplomatic consent process some of it is old hat that you guys have all seen before but if there are new faces we always like to go over some of the basics again uh, but we'll try to keep it higher level uh, next slide please so this is our team i'm amanda williams i'm the maritime geographer in the office of ocean and polar affairs of the department of state and with me today are Emma Tully and Gabriella David, who are also in the same office. Allison Reed, as you all know well, uh, she's the lead on the portfolio, but she's not actually able to make the meeting today because she has moved to Rome, of all places. Uh, her husband's foreign service, and so he was uh, placed on orders there. And so she gets to go live in Rome for three years, so that she's already in bed for tonight. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to introduce some faces with our team members. Next slide, please. So just a quick refresher, the Law of the Sea Convention outlines all the reasons why um, State Department manages the MSR process and the various regulations that we follow when it comes to MSR conducted in the Territorial Sea, the EEZ, reporting, the right to conduct MSR, all sorts of articles. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Law of the Sea Convention, we can always have a side chat with you about that, but um, just a reminder on some of these articles. And the foreign counterparts that we typically work with are the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is uh, so obviously similar to the State Department. Next slide, please. So as you all know, getting your MSR consent is complicated. The optics um, are always changing because ships are unique. Uh, if you think about maybe what a NOAA ship looks like, that kind of looks like a Navy vessel. Uh, we have tall ships with the Sea Education Association. We have all sorts of vessels that are out there. And then scientific equipment, as you know, is constantly changing with sail drones, AUVs, um, all sorts of new gear, large and small. So the optics can always be a little bit disconcerting for a foreign country if, they don't, if they're not aware of what's going on. And so that's part of the bureaucracy is making sure everyone's educated on this process. Um, geopolitics are, of course, an issue. Maritime boundaries especially play a role. If there's a dispute in an area, we do ask all claimants. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Hmm. <laughs> she, wants <laughs> she wants to kill the mailman. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, you made my dog bark too. I knew she was going to do that. Um, so geopolitics are obviously an issue and so we have to kind of be cognizant of who are the players at the table um if you're familiar with anything going on in the eastern mediterranean right now there's there's a lot of hot uh areas going going on uh there we can't solely reply solely rely on past practice 
these relationships and the situations evolve constantly. There's always new paperwork. There's always new administrations, as we know ourselves, that, that can change um, things that are at play. The, the consent process is cumbersome, and we know that, and we know there's a lot of paperwork, but for the aforementioned reason, reasons, obviously, um, it's, it's, there's a reason why. And it's never guaranteed. You know, we could say, oh, we got consent from Mexico the last five years. Why are we not getting it this year? Well, it's because something somewhere has changed. And COVID has been a big change to a lot of um, these countries. But I think a lot of countries are starting to re look at their legislation and kind of reevaluate everything. So we've seen a number of changes, which Gabby's going to go through a lot of those. Um, so we're always there. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, you probably heard that in September of last year, because I, I believe we would have announced this at the last UNALS meeting, um, there was a presidential proclamation that changed the requirement for foreign scientists to now uh, be required to apply for consent in the US EEZ. It was always required on the territorial sea, but now in the, e the EEZ and on the continental shelf, uh, consent is always required. Before it was just for a handful of reasons, uh, but now it's for any, any and all reason for doing MSR. So in 1983 or 84, President Reagan had put out a proclamation kind of making it say that he wanted science to be free and open and have the information flow. Um, and so that's why he didn't actually require consent in the EEZ. But unfortunately, none of the other countries around the world followed suit and um, are pretty strict about a lot of their MSR requirements. And so we finally, um, changed our legislation and that allows us now to really know and regulate who's doing research in our waters and be sure we can get that data from, from any foreign scientists. Next slide, please. At this point, I'm gonna turn over to Gabby to talk about US scientists in foreign waters. Hi everyone, it's so good to see you again this year. Um, I'm just gonna talk about, like Amanda said, US scientists in foreign waters. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with this process. Um, when a scientist or when cruise plans are finalized, um, the chief scientist and the platform operator reach out to us at marinescientiststate.gov. Um, we create these accounts so that you can access RATS. Um, an application goes into RATS, we review it, we check it against the guidelines and all of the requirements, and then we process it to the embassy. The embassy then does their review, um, drafts a dip note, and submits this package to the coastal state counterpart. Um, and that's when the six month review deadline begins. So um, it's not just getting it into us when we say, oh, deadlines, deadlines, it um, has to get through us and through the embassy and then the review starts. So that's the deadline we're talking about. Um, and then during the six months review, we'll get some questions back and forth between the, the coastal state, the embassy, us and the scientists. And hopefully uh, six months later, we'll get consent. Um, and then the cruise can begin. And three months after that, the preliminary report is due. And about two years after that, the final report is due. Um, next slide, please. Here's a map that Emma put together just to show the effects that COVID had on our MSR applications. So typically we, re we receive between 300 and 400 applications a year. Um, in 2020, we received 249 and 74 cancellations. Um, that's huge. We usually only get a handful of cancellations because of weather or ship maintenance, but never 74. Um, WHA has a large number of these applications. That's mainly Canada and Mexico. Um, next slide, please. We just wanted to highlight some challenges. So applications that do at least six to 6.5 months in advance. Our guidance page has each of uh, coastal states specific requirements, but um, this is again, not to us, but to the coastal state. They, they need this time to review. So get it in as soon as possible. Um, late reports have been an issue. We highlighted um, some countries that are starting to withhold or delay consent because of outstanding reports. So if you're planning to go to any of these um, coastal states, do a quick search, make sure none of your reports are outstanding because it may affect the consent decision. Next slide, please. Um, some more trends is the requirement um, of changes. So, so we've 
since everybody's having issues with COVID, halfway through some of these application reviews, we're receiving new requirements. And sometimes they're lengthy, sometimes they're hard to obtain. So not only are the new requirements a challenge, but the timing of them is extremely challenging. Um, then participants, we're, seeing an, we're still seeing an increase in participant um, and observers being included on these cruises. And now with the protocols and the quarantine, like it can get very tricky. So definitely look out for those things. Um, and then if you do have like requirements for COVID quarantine, please include that if, in case the coastal state wants an obser observer so they know what to be aware of in the beginning. Um, next slide, please. And then coastal state requirements. So our marine science guidance page, I'm sure most of you are familiar. Um, this is where we try to keep all of our updated guidance. If you see anything that needs to be added, please flag it for us. Um, but most recently, the Bahamas lifted their moratorium on sampling, um, but then they have a new online portal, which is extremely challenging if you try to go to the Bahamas. Um, we've heard a lot of technical issues, so definitely factor in some time for that. There's also been a new fee structure um, that you should be aware of. Barbados has a longer review process now that the prime minister review is included. Canada is very firm on their timing. Um, of application submission. So please submit that on time because they're definitely overwhelmed. And then Cuba has started accepting applications, uh, but it's still a challenge. And they are, between Cuba and Guatemala, they are both two countries that expect to have observers on board. Um, next slide, please. France is very firm on their uh, processing deadline and they're 6.5 months um, in advance that they need an application to be submitted. Also, they are one of the ones that will ask for reports. Um, if, you, if you have any outstanding, you plan to go to any of the French territories, please make sure those reports are in. We've been having trouble getting consent from Mexico this year. Um, most, most recently, we've started getting consent, but if you're planning to go to Mexico, put a buffer um, at least a week or two weeks before the actual cruise start date, because even if we get consent, you still have to go through a visa process and um, Mexico's requirements are already lengthy. Um, the Philippines has started receiving MSR applications, but they will not accept it if it's late. So we're happy that they're now open to accepting, but you have to be on time. Um, next slide, please. And then we had a talk with Argentina earlier this year and they really are interested in collaborating. So if you are interested in doing work in Argentina, please let us know. Um, Carabas has a new fee that um, we've had a couple applications come through. Uh, Japan has definitely had an increase in requirements, um, but all of those should be listed on our guidance page. And we haven't had any trouble with consent yet, um, just a lot of additional requirements. And then the UK territories need to be submitted 6.5 months in advance now too. Um, next slide, please. And I will turn the presentation over to Emma to talk more about reports. Hi everyone, this is Emma Tully. Um, I'm sure you've seen me via email, emailing you all about outstanding reports since that's uh, a big part of my portfolio. Um, but before I get into the meat of that, I really just wanted to give a big thank you to everyone for actually um, handing in reports. So since we spoke last, uh, the UNALS community has handed in over 180 reports, which is a fantastic number. Thank you so much. Um, we still do have over uh, 300 outstanding reports though, but I know we'll get to the finish line uh, at some point, um, given the positive trend that we're on, so thank you so much. Um, but the real reason why uh, getting these reports in is so important is because coastal states actually have the right to withhold consent um, on the basis of any US scientists outstanding reports. So even if you have everything handed in, if your colleague doesn't, then you could potentially get denied. So it's really important um, that you have a look at your own files and make sure that everything's been handed in. Um, but you'll most, some of you also will probably be hearing uh, from me via email um, over the course of the next few months and weeks. Um, yes, but 
that's about all I have to say about outstanding reports. So onto the next slide, please. So this is just a quick uh, refresher on who should request MSR consent. Um, so for most coastal states, it's actually the flag state of the vessel who should apply. The US, we do it differently. It's the nationality of the chief scientist. And then for Canada, it's the owner of the data. And this is a really important facet to get right because uh, for example, in the uh, Calypso project, it used to be a US uh, flagged vessel and halfway through um, the reviewing process when they had submitted an application, the vessel flag had changed. So a lot of coastal states required a totally new application from a totally new country. And it really just, um, a lot of uh, coastal states actually didn't end up giving consent to the crews, unfortunately. So it's important to get that um, factor right. Next slide, please. And here, I'll just quickly go over some helpful tips that'll help you hopefully with your applications. So first and foremost, like Gabby said, uh, please submit it as early as possible. We know that most coastal states require um, six months before the cruise start date, though we would prefer if you submitted it seven months. So that way the State Department, including our embassies, have plenty of time to actually um, get these applications to the foreign governments. Um, and on that note, it's also important to build in a time buffer. So one week on either end of your project, just so in case a coastal state um, is late on granting their decision, then at least you have a little bit of uh, less stress when you have a buffer. Um, another important thing to note is no maritime boundaries on the cruise track. And if you end up having any social media content, such as photos or videos from your respective cruises, feel free to share them with us because we're happy to share that on our State Department channels as well. Um, you can always reach out to us at marinescience at state.gov to follow up on your status of your request. And uh, once again, please make sure to submit um, your reports on time, uh, just so that outstanding number doesn't hike up. And also uh, another thing I wanted to note is um, have a close look at the consent letters you get because some coastal states have different deadlines um, for these reports. So for example, uh, France actually wants the final report um, a year rather than two years after the end of the cruise. Um, and the last tip we have is to please submit as early as possible. Um, next slide, please. And as Gabby mentioned, here are some links that are helpful for you all. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with them, but the most important one will obviously be the required documentation by Coastal State, which we update on a regular basis. Next slide. And that concludes our presentation. If you have any um, questions or anything, feel free to reach out to us at marinescienceatstate.gov. Um, but on that note, I will, I guess, open up the floor for questions. Thank you. Uh, I just wanna say thanks, Amanda, Gabby, and Emma has a great presentation. Um, just off the bat, I will, I'm gonna take that presentation and forward it to all the Marine superintendents because uh, there's a lot of good update information. So they have the latest and greatest when they're processing the MSR applications for the science parties. Great. And I also wanted to make a plug that with our new marine facilities planning, it'll be easier now for PIs to put the, put the graphics in with the marine boundaries on it and their cruise tracks or uh, their science plans. Because that's actually a layer in the, uh, the science planning uh, part of a module on in, the, in, in MFP. So I think that'll help a lot getting more information there, making it easier to process the MSRs. Where do they get their maritime boundaries from? Is it more? It's a service. I can find that out for you. Uh, the developer has a service that they use and they've used, they use it with the Europeans also. So okay. I can find that out though. It's probably marine regions from the Flanders Institute. And so I will say that while that data is pretty good, it's not US government authoritative for one thing. So we don't lean on it 100% uh, because they draw median lines. So like a hypothetical maritime boundary, they'll, they'll draw. And so even if a country is claiming more, um, that layer, if, assuming it's the same thing, has um, basically said, well, this is the halfway point. So. Uh, mm -hmm it can be a little misleading. And so I still always check all the cruise tracks when they come in um, 
But of course, we don't want to see any maritime boundaries or EEZs on these cruise tracks because right. of the fact that some of them could be disputed. So um, it's helpful for cruise planning, of course. But yeah, definitely still leave those off the track and know that I'll, I'll still check. <laughs> And going on with MFP, we are also, as we get more institutions involved with the cruise planning side of it, some of the post-cruise um, workflow steps, we'll say, will include the reports. So there'll be a step that says, you know, if, if they have any easy or if they have a MSR, you know, um, submit your, your um, preliminary report and then a deadline to submit their final report. So it's going to be glaring at them uh, every time they go into MFP. So I think hopefully that will be helpful. Uh, so we got several questions. Mark Brzezinski, would you like to go first? Sure, a uh, question for Emma. Emma, you, you mentioned the number of outstanding reports, which was pretty large. Um, how many countries are affected? Do you have a sense? Um, unfortunately, I haven't run those numbers, but um, there has been a trend where more countries have been asking for outstanding reports, uh, so such as Mexico and um, France. So that was outlined in the slide, um, but I'm not entirely, I can't give you a specific number, unfortunately. There's a lot though. <laughs> and, and it could increase, um, as they have said, how many countries will require these reports to be submitted. Uh, and again, we would be happy to get your report and have a look at that and make sure that our marine superintendents and the operators know, you know, where all of our lists are the same. So feel free to send it. I know last time there were a lot of NOAA reports on there too, which we are not so involved with. So feel free to send it to me, Emma. Um, Bruce Applegate, you had a question too. Sure, this one uh, relates to what Gabby was saying, but I guess it could be for anybody there. Uh, I had a question about Guatemala and this new requirement they've got for an NDA that's signed by someone on the ship. I'm just curious, is that a unique and new sort of thing? And uh, is, does the state have any guidance on how an institution might approach the requirement for having an NDA? I mean, who's required to sign it? The Guatemala one just wants a lawyer and a notary as well as an authorized person, but it, it seemed very odd to me. Um, yeah, <laughs> so we did kind of loop in our, co our colleagues in our L office. Um, and because it's so new, state doesn't have any like specific guidance right now. We're kind of just working through it as it comes. Um, and, it, and have you seen it? It's more about data and like the results and reporting after the cruise. So, so we're working with the authorities now in the embassy to try to see if we can kind of get some voice of reason so we can make these cruises doable. Um, but everything's so new, like uh, within the past month or so that it's coming about Guatemala. So we're definitely working through it. Um, to add to that, countries are allowed to require receipt, receipt of the data prior to making it go public. It's just that they cannot prevent the data from being public because that's part of the law of the sea convention. So um, that's that's part of it that we're trying to sort out. Is that really what they mean by this NDA or is it just that they want the data first? Because um, that's something that Argentina has expressed to us that they want the data first prior to going public, but they've not restricted it going public. So um, yeah, we it's, it's so new as Gabby said that we don't have all the answers just yet. And we definitely are working on it though. And it's definitely an ongoing conversation. So we flagged it for the embassy and um, they're working with Guatemala. Thank you. Great, and we had one last question. It was from Kiri Strom. Kiri, are you there? Hello, yes, I am. Uh, just wanna say, I'm thrilled that the State Department is packed with this A-team of women because it. When I started, it used to be just poor Allison, <laughs> but uh, it's been so great that you guys have responded and helped out quite a bit uh, since you came on board. Uh, but I, uh, to Mark's uh, question, I have six outstanding uh, reports due, but three of them were from canceled cruises. And that is forever on my record. <laughs> you know, like I want a clean slate, uh, but those will never be submitted. So is it possible to 
remove those with the new I know you did some upgrades in rats is that now an option yeah if you could um you could send us an email and I can have a look um and we can have like a further conversation about that but since they were canceled obviously um no reports can be handed in um but there's an there is an option to fix that that's great yeah Yeah, because I want to be taken off the naughty list for those (laughs) oh here you're never on our naughty list (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Always okay. that eight student. <laughs> oh, did we lose somebody? Okay, that's all we have for questions. Well, thank you. We really appreciate your attention and, and do not have to send us an email, of course. Um Emailing marinesciencesstate.gov is the best way to get in touch with us because you never know when somebody's on leave or working on a different project or something. And so that way at least gets to the whole team and we can expedite your your question. So thanks. Great. Thanks, Amanda and Gabby and Emma. Uh, Really a lot of great information today. Thanks. And thanks for all your hard work. I'll echo what everybody else has already said. We know you do a lot of work behind the scenes and it's pretty thankless work a lot of the days. So thank you for soldiering on. Thanks so much. We really appreciate that. And I, and we'll be sure to let Allison know uh, the same and she misses not being here. I don't know if she's in Italy. She's probably not missing it so much. You're right. Who am I kidding? (laughs) Rob Sparrick, you ready to uh, present? I think so. Can you hear me? We can. All right. Just let me know when you're on the first slide and then you can quickly go to slide two. Okay, I'm on the open slide and I'm going to slide two, agency update update to UNOS 2021. Okay, if I were to give you the boring update, I would just basically say we're doing more of the same thing. Things are stable, our funding is stable. Uh, I would echo all the comments that Bob had on the uh, state of the community. I'd like to give additional praise to the Mariners themselves who've been uh, coping and managing uh, operations in uh, quite a bit of hardship. So while many of us have uh, hunkered down and learned how to Zoom and, uh, you know, the challenge of getting dressed in the morning, I know the Mariners have had it uh, had it quite rough and it reflects in the uh, problems in the manpower for the community as well. Um, I'll get to that in the next slide of some things that I might be able to do to help with manpower. And then finally, uh, another growth area or area of concern, I should say, is uh, cybersecurity. If a budget does get approved, there's a potential that there'll be a congressional ad and there'll be some additional funds that, uh, uh, thanks to scripts, uh, might be secured to be able to further uh, enhance the cybersecurity on the research vessels. Uh, Other areas of uh, growth within the Navy uh, are seabed scientific discoveries. So we're very concerned about the seabed, uh, not necessarily something I want to put on the slide. Uh, internal to Navy, uh, we suck at IT systems. Uh, we currently have implemented new IT systems. There are people in three different statuses of implementation. There's a fourth status uh, called you were left off on the upgrade list for no good reason, but that's not an official category. Um, so uh, we will all get new emails here in the next year and a half. Uh, many people are running around with two emails that uh, in the background, when you get an email, it, you can't really tell which email it's coming from. Uh, you'll notice our IT systems uh, send out links that uh, disable how we do things. So uh, even our, on our end, cybersecurity is a problem. We've gone to new systems and uh, we're in quite the growing pains because of it. Uh, are there any questions on the status quo before I go on to the next slide? Don't see any. All right, uh, next slide, Alice. There we are, Woo, that's a lot of words. All right, so I humored myself and said, you know, I really didn't have that much to say. So I said, well, what if I were given an agency update brief in 2035? Uh, what kind of things would I be talking about? And so you can call this a made up list, a what might be going on in my head list of what things would look like and I'll try to Uh, I tried to make some of them semi-provocative, so hopefully they can elicit some questions or at least thoughts. So 
I suspect at some point we will be updating, refining the global class requirements document so that we can start building uh, four new globals. Uh, I presume that we will have the three replaced. We'll be also replacing the Ron Brown, which will have successfully done a midlife of its own. And the thing that we'll be debating is uh, whether to extend Thompson, because Thompson and uh, Atlanta, I'm sorry, Ravel have a, uh, a quite a large gap in between them. And someone in the future might be saying we need to extend Thompson so that we don't shorten unnecessarily the life of Ravel and Atlantis. Uh, and I could see keeping Thompson to 49 years as a possible thing, but uh, could come with some challenges. Uh, I think the Arctic will be different than the Arctic is today. Uh, I think the Navy has a nice new Arctic strategy that mirrors the Department of Defenses and the Coast Guard as similar ones. I can imagine in 15 years we're rewriting that Arctic um, strategy and we're trying to think how the research vessels might enhance either the polar security cutters, which are already doing their things at that time, or more remotely manned craft that are operating in the Arctic. Um, how we interact with the other Arctic nations, uh, including the Russians, who are right now contemplating building an Arctic fleet. Um, I could see that we have so much data that we don't even know what to do with it, and we've decided at ONR to add a data ma management science position. And because we have all this data from that's been turned in by these foreign people and people like Kerry who finally gotten off and uh, gotten in their reports, we just have so much data, we don't know what to do with it, and we decide we're going to add a data management position because um, there are all these different things that are besides the fleet that are producing oceanographic data. Uh, I could envision us adding a strategic sea lift officer reserve billet. Now, the Navy has something called the Navy Reserve, and most people are familiar with that. Uh, one of the subspecialties within the Navy Reserve are merchant marine officers. Um, most of the people who sail know they went to one of the uh, state maritime colleges, and at those colleges they have ROTC units, and some of the people who were there on scholarship uh, wind up getting a Navy Reserve commitment. And that community is about 2,400 people who, generally speaking, have unlimited licenses, have a commitment to serve, and have a requirement to serve in the Navy. And I could see potentially in the future as manpower struggles are um, being mitigated, that that community would have a role in the future of global classes. Uh, I think the global classes cybersecurity infrastructure is going to continue to be a challenge. And it would not surprise me if uh, 15 years from now, I'm talking about the Navy actually uh, enhancing the cybersecurity of the research vessels, similar to initiatives that they may take with the polar security cutters, uh, because I see an integration of the global class ships and all these unmanned things, and the weak link in that, of course, is the cyber. Uh, I could see a situation where these strategic sea lift officers are also trained as liaison officers to observe the foreign research vessels. Uh, there's a lot of peer competition. There are a lot of other nations that build research vessels, and some of those research vessels work in the US EEZ, and some of those, um, we're probably more interested in what kind of research they're doing. So it would not surprise me in the future, uh, particularly of some of the countries that are building large research fleets, we would wanna have observers on that. I could imagine that Alvin is still around and doing its 6,000th dive. And uh, I know we just finished talking about midlife, so we'll probably talk about it here. I, I, I promised myself it was one of the words I didn't want to use was midlife in my brief, but uh, perhaps in 15 years, I'm talking about the midlife of the uh, ocean class. And then finally, I have a note here about the term, the U.S. Academic Research Fleet, and I hypothesize that it actually becomes a, a term in law that you can actually find where the, uh, and perhaps the best place for that would be in the National Oceanographic Partnership Program reauthorization bill that uh, might, you know, celebrate its, I don't know how many years that's been, the 50th anniversary of uh, the NOP program. Interestingly enough, the term U.S. Academic Research Fleet is not really codified in U.S. law. Uh, for some of those who have had some dealings with some of the things I've had to deal with this year, uh, the legal term for that is often 
uh, create some consternation, particularly with the Coast Guard. Uh, I'm going to keep going, and hopefully that list of wishful thinking will elicit some questions. Next slide, please. So the research fleet, again, largely whole, everyone's upgraded, and the only thing that I think is going away is Alvin and, uh, I'm sorry, Flip, and we're looking for a place to actually dismantle that or um, still looking for anyone who would be interested in keeping parts of it as a museum. Next slide. Uh, Alvin is really, really close. Um, I think on Wednesday we will have permission from NAVC, which is the certifying agency, uh, to go on and complete the uh, final testing for uh, Alvin's 6,500-meter uh, upgrade. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide is just to remind you that the uh, Navy Postgraduate School uh, meteorological aircraft is still around and uh, still available. And while it's primarily funded by ONR, I hope other users uh, take advantage of the uh, financial incentives that I am providing to make that aircraft more attractive to other users. Next slide, please. Are you on the uh, uh, means, way, and end model slide there, Alice? Alice? Yes. Yeah, she is. Oh. Sorry. So uh, ends, ways, and means define a strategic plan. And the ends are the strategic outcome or desired out, out, uh, end state. And so ways are the methods, the tactics, the procedures, the practices to achieve those ends. And means are defined as the resources to achieve those ends. At one point when I started this job, I really thought of the ends as the research vessel themselves. Right. My job was to spend federal money, work with UNALs, and produce research vessels. And I've come to think that perhaps my job is more so to produce oceanographic data is the ends. That's what I'm producing. And we often at ONR focus on models of taking basic science and applying and handing it off to applied and taking applied and handing it off to further projects. And so in that same vein, I see myself primarily as someone whose job at ONR is to provide oceanographic data to other users. Uh, typically, this is in a one-for-one -one ratio. Someone funds a PI, they go out on a cruise, they take that oceanographic data, and they do something with it. But I think we're going to start uh, coming into a, an area where there's so much data and that that data is going to need more and more collaborative tools to make it as efficient as possible. Um, also, when you're doing this um, means, ways, and ends model, you have to think of what your strategic environment is. And so I think for me, my strategic environment is the geopolitical climate, as uh, particularly as DOD sees it. I see it as the demographics and values of the nation, such as diversity, inclusion, and targeting uh, uh, the youth in STEM, particularly in ocean sciences. And depending on which administration you're in, uh, climate change is also another part of the major reason for taking some of this oceanographic data. So I use this slide when I often am asked to brief about the ONR ships to an internal audience. It's one thing for me to say, I am the program manager at ONR, I own these six ships, but it's a different thing to say, I'm the program manager and I work with this great community of people who have all kinds of collaborative tools and methods of gathering data, any of which are available to you and I'm happy to help you meet that need. So don't think of me as just managing six ships. Think of me as helping facilitate access to this wide variety of databases that uh, exist. Um, so I just wanted to share that kind of thought that I've had about my job and the time that I've been, uh, been here, and hopefully I'll get some comments on that. Uh, last slide, please. Uh, this is a slide courtesy of uh, Bruce Applegate. And uh, it really kind of confirms to me the strategic outlook of the research vessels themselves and why I think that we need to continue to have research vessels. Um, you can own, you know, if you look at this slide, it's really hard to imagine this being all done by unmanned systems. Um, you know, you, you can have robot Bruce Applegate maybe there talking to the kids, but um, you know, I don't think it's the same thing. So with that, 
I hope I didn't go too quick um, and I'm ready for any questions or thoughts. I appreciate the time to uh, speak to this uh, great group of peers and friends. I did want to take a few moments to say um, thank you for some of the uh, comments on Colin Powell's uh, passing. As uh, some of you know, my mother and uh, Colin Powell were childhood friends, and uh, I have a very uh, long history with him, with my parents also being immigrants from the uh, West Indies. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Bob. And uh, so sorry to hear about that. I didn't realize uh, Colin Powell's relationship with your family. So hopefully you're. Um, our thoughts are with you and your family. Uh, questions for Rob? And I can't see hands up, so Alice, if you could coordinate that. I don't see any questions. Should we bring back that slide, that our 2035 slide? Yeah, could you touch upon that, uh, Rob? This, You'll hear in the FIC update, uh, the science mission requirements for the global class of actually, we're just finishing those up now. We're pretty much done. We just, it's actually up to the office to do a little bit of cleanup and we'll have the latest version of the global class science mission requirements, which will feed into your 2035 ver vision. Although I would expect there'll be a few more turns on that between now and then. <laughs> That's quite a ways away, but it is near and dear to the community's heart. And the FIC has been working on that, actually thinking ahead like you are. Yeah, I think it's going to be an iterative process. That would be my imagine, uh, my prediction. The Navy has a document called the 30-Year Shipbuilding Plan. Uh, it's public record. You could Google it, uh, the various iterations of it. Uh, and in the 30-Year Shipbuilding Plan, it's an annex actually to the Navy budget and re required by law. There's a brief mention of the AGORS. And it says something like, the AGORs fill no Navy mission and that they work for another agency. And I'm offered humor being in the Navy, reading the Navy's own document where it says, yeah, we acknowledge these things are in the 30th shipbuilding plan, but they don't actually do a Navy mission. So the, uh, the, the AGORs are a very difficult thing to explain to your average person in the Navy. Um, they, they don't understand it. They don't know why we have it. They don't know why this isn't somebody else's mission. Um, you often get, I'll give you an example, the head of the Oceanography Command, um, well, I shouldn't say the head, but someone in the Oceanography Command making the statement that the Navy doesn't do maritime scientific research. And that's a 99% true statement because they're only thinking about the Navy in the classical sense. Um, so when ramifications are, we're having meetings on uh, what do we think about some of the things that came up in the State Department brief? The Navy's initial position is this doesn't matter to us because it doesn't affect us. Uh, and maybe for some of you, that's hard to believe that that's the way the Navy thinks, but they just don't think of the research vessels. We're kind of a, an asterisk with uh, no real good ties. But as the Navy is trying to develop the new fleet in 15 years, I think there are going to be so many unmanned platforms they're going to be looking for a platform that knows how to operate at sea and knows how to interact with unmanned platforms. And I think that will provide um, strengthening for the Navy's argument to continue to buy global class ships, even against the Navy's decision to buy other things. Does that help answer your question, Doug? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Rob. Appreciate the, uh, the explanations and the vision. So I hope that it's hopefully for, hopeful, helpful for everybody. Uh, Jim Swift does have a question. You want to go ahead, Jim? Oh, I was yes, just a, Jim. <laughs> yeah, it's a statement here that the, uh, the uh, backing up what Doug said about the, uh, uh, the science mission requirements for the global class. I thought it was interesting your statement regarding that the globals uh, enhanced to work in the new Arctic. Uh, we might uh, we might want to, uh, to set up a dialogue between uh, uh, you and the Fleet Improvement Committee. Uh, the the, the uh, science mission requirements are a living document. We might want an annex to them, which regards uh, operations uh, in uh, high latitude regions, future operations in high latitude regions. There's been a lot of thinking about that also in the Office of Polar Programs, which has been looking into uh, 
the uh, Nathaniel Palmer replacement. So there's been a lot of thinking about the requirements for research ships to operate in high latitude regions. And we might make that a little bit of an annex to the science mission requirements for the globals. So just sort of additional considerations for polar ops or something like that. Just, just, just noting that now. Yeah. You know, this is completely speculative, but you know, in 10 years from now, the Navy builds classes of ships in big chunks. So if they're sitting there trying to make a decision of, well, we think we want to play in the Arctic. We want more stuff to go to the Arctic. Well, what are they going to do? Build a, a 20 class ship of frigates to go to the Arctic? You know, that 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 becomes less realistic. So uh, a four ship or a three ship class of research vessels seems relatively easy if somebody decides I want to have a presence in the Arctic without having to um, make major changes in warships. So it's an easy, it seems like an easy win that I could envision someone making a decision 10 years from now. Right, yeah, even without ice, there's a lot of considerations for work in polar regions. Uh, the air is cold and you still get, there's a lot to talk, more, more than the subject for this meeting. But anyway, it's something we can, we'll look forward to a continued dialogue over the next year or so. Thank you. Any other questions for Rob? Well, as you ponder these questions and ideas that Rob posts, uh, feel free to reach out to him and or we can bring him up in our uh, upcoming sessions uh, we'll be talking over the next few weeks. Uh, there's some good, good things to be thinking about long term wise. Mm -hmm. um, with that, uh, Claire Marsden, Sur Surrey Marsden is here from um, Noah to give us an update today on what's going on with them. Good afternoon, all. Can you see me all right? And, and Claire, congratulations. I see you've been promoted recently, so we're, we're happy <laughs> to have you. Oh, thanks for catching that. <laughs> uh, all right, well, thank you all very much. Um, sorry I'm a little bit um, later in the afternoon. Uh, so we, um, so just a, kind of an update on where we've been um, for the past uh, since the spring for uh, for Omeo and Noah, so um, Alice, you can go ahead and, and do the first slide. So we continue um, to very much value our Noah and UNALS partnership, um, continuing with uh, our our sort of normal operations and exchanges of information. So councils, um, you know, ship scheduling meetings. We optimize our operations. Um, Noah. Principal investigators know that they can always um, go to UNALS if uh, they need help with a particular charter. We have our two interagency agreements in which we can share uh, ship time with each other, which we use very frequently. So thank you for that. Of course, uh, projects that we have um, cross lines on. Um, we've been investigating um, and watching very closely how you all have been doing your um, marine um, planning uh, program. So uh, we're, we're sort of investigating if we want to use that as well. Um, and of course, very close contact, exchanging information on um, COVID-19 um, and all things um, uh, related to that and fleet operations. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. So some highlights uh, for us uh, in NOAA, um, you know, we, our Admiral, um, Admiral Han, um, her sort of, uh, you know, the way she approaches things, our people, metal mission, you know, uh, the people are the most important part of our uh, operations. And so some updates, uh, we've updated our, our wage mariner hiring portal to make it easier um, for people to be able to get on and see what our fleet vacancies are. Um, we, like most of the maritime world, are seeing some staffing crunches uh, for sure, and uh, that Mariner hiring portal has been pretty helpful. We've also been advertising quite a bit on social media platforms, Instagram and Facebook, uh, and some various other things that have been helping um, to uh, recruit new folks. And so 
Um, I know uh, we've been in contact with Doug and Alice about exchanging some of that information. So happy to help there and uh, vice versa, of course. Uh, some other things that we've uh, instituted for our people, a mentorship program within the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations. One exists within NOAA as it is, but um, because as you all know, fleet life is so specific, um, having one just internal to us has been um, something we've been trying to do for a long time. And so we're just getting that off the ground. Uh, you may have heard in the uh, in the news, the NOAA Corps Reauthorization Act uh, is a bill that basically um, allows us to strengthen our NOAA Corps numbers, which will help um, with uh, fleet staffing in the uh, next 10, 20 years. We also have hired a program manager for our diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility program. Uh, and started a study within um, specifically OMAO um, to see where we can be improving um, in that manner. And there's definitely a long way to go. We've also increased our competitive training opportunities quite a bit across OMAO. Many people have been taking advantage of that um, and has been helpful for retention. So for our um, Platform infrastructure and acquisition division's been very busy. We just uh, established our own PIAD um, platform um, group. So class A uh, has, is under construction. Class B has been awarded. Um, PIAD director Greg Raymond will be coming to speak with the group on November 1st. Um, more about those um, acquisitions. So that has been, um, Full ahead. Ship repairs, we've moved most of our into the first quarter of FY22 or just last quarter, which has been helpful in extending our field seasons, getting the repair periods in early November, December, when most people are, 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 are happy to take off um, and getting the field season kind of um, more extended. We also have a facility lease at the Roger Wicker Center for Ocean Enterprise in Gulfport. Um, we'll be doing our unmanned crew, uncrewed systems, excuse me, um, operations from that facility, which also has the opportunity to um, house two ships, gear face for two ships. Uh, and in, um, we just received funding to um, rebuild the port facility and the decrepit pier at Ketchikan, Alaska. So lots of, um, lots of positive news going towards our infrastructure and ships there. And for the 21 um, fleet allocation plan, we ended up sailing just over 2,000 days at sea with 62 projects completed, um, a few uncrewed system ships-based research projects last year, and those will be upticked um, in the next couple of years. And of course, uh, we'll have, you know, we all have the same challenges. Uh, we lost 250 days at sea just from uh, our catching of COVID cases prior to getting underway. So a lot of staffing um, replacements had to be done. The relief pool was, was, was strained um, to say the least. And there were some times where we couldn't fill staffing. We did have two positive cases underway on one of our ships. Um, those folks were isolated right away, picked up by rapid tests. Uh, ship came in right away and we got those persons off contact tracing and um, the isolation proved to be very effective uh, and we kept it um, from most of the other personnel or all the other personnel. The uh, note there about COVID protocols just being very hard on the personnel, um, you know, we have 45 day at sea bubbles where we try to keep the same personnel on board or if they have to switch out crew, those crew will have to go through the same or a seven day shelter in place, um, which everyone who comes on board must, um, must adhere to. Strict shelter in place, um, two tests, one PCR um, during shelter in place and one rapid test before get, um, getting on the ship. Uh, we are in the process of kind of revamping those protocols based on 100% vaccination rates on ships. Our vaccination is required um, for anybody going on the ships. There's some operational logistic um, extensions that are in place. Uh, we're going through the process for medical and um, 
uh, religious reasonable accommodation. Um, but as of today, we, at the end of November is our drop dead date to not allow any personnel who are not vaccinated on any of our NOAA platforms. And so that's probably gonna affect um, manning a little bit. Uh, we're up to about 94%, I think, within OMEO for vaccination. Um, but there will be some, some impacts for sure. We'll have to for, deal with those um, as they come. And then that last point there is just uh, we do have, we're maintaining our uh, nav station, Newport, Rhode Island, Homeport, and Charleston, um, but they do need some updates. So we'll be looking at um, some funding requests for them. And then I just put the picture of the, the US revenue cutter bear there. Um, we did not find her remains on a NOAA ship, but we did uh, have a lot of NOAA um, sanctuary and um, heritage personnel working on that. So Admiral Hahn was actually just in Boston with the Coast Guard announcing that um, we had helped discover um, the resting place of the US cutter uh, bear. So. I just put that picture there because I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> All right, Alice. So moving forward to fiscal year 22, this is our fleet allocation plans. We've got just over 2650 days planned. Um, we do have um, some expected funding that will come through. Uh, the president's budget did um, allow for some more funding for us to try to reach a higher number, 29, 45 days at sea. So we're waiting on the Senate marks and the president's budget to see if we're gonna be able to increase those days at sea. But as of our current spending, um, this is what we're looking at. And some of the highlights for this group, the Ron Brown is on GOMEC 4 as we speak. She'll be doing Parada Northeast Extension and then go ship a 13.5, so she'll be making um, a trip to South Africa. We are doing very, very many operational risk assessments <laughs> to make, make that happen. Uh, but for now, that is um, a go. And thank you again, Yunos, for your um, advice there. Thomas Jefferson will be doing some hydrographic work in Lake Erie. That's the first time one of the NOAA ships has been up there for a very long time, one of the larger white hole vessels. So that's pretty exciting. And then um, Shimada, just some of the projects that we share, um, Cork and CCE, um, and the International Year of the Salmon Project, which we're excited about. All right, next slide. And I know y'all are tracking um, the Ron Brown Midlife. We've been very grateful to your experience on the Thompson Revell in Atlantis. So thank you for your information there. Um, we do have this scheduled in the pres bud. Um, of course, that has to has yet to be seen if we get that full amount, um, but that is what we've asked for uh, for a 12 month midlife repair period. Um, we did put those requests for proposals out. We're on, in review right now. We should contract award uh, next or this fiscal year, later this fiscal year, and then uh, should be all done by 2024. All right, Alice, next. And then I'll just touch briefly um, for those of you who might not be able to join on the first. So we do have recapitalization efforts uh, in the works. So um, class A is our Agor variant. The oceanographer will be in Honolulu and discoverer will be in Newport, Rhode Island. Their primary mission is oceanographic monitoring, research and modeling um, with some living marine resources as a secondary mission. This was a Navy assisted acquisition, which means NOAA was the subject matter expert, um, but the Navy is really re leading that acquisition, um, which is a little bit different from our class B, which we will be leading from the NOAA side and the Navy will be assisting um, design engineering through an IAA. And the class B will be doing chartering and surveying um, and secondary assessment of, of marine life monitoring. All right, I think the last slide. I think there's one more. I think. Oh, nope, that was it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I had more to say than I did. But um, happy to answer any questions. And again, just thank you. We really appreciate the, um, the partnership with UNALS. Um, and um, 
happy to support and be supported. Thanks, Claire. Appreciate that update. Um, a lot going on. And Noah, congratulations on the funding for your new ship classes. That's a big deal. And uh, really a big congratulations in finding the bear. That's a big deal, too. Um, Elroy it Mike good... really is <laughs> much happier grave now. Uh, well, we question. have one question, yeah, from Kiri. Go ahead, Kiri. Hey, yeah. Thank you, Commander. That's a great presentation. I have two questions. Uh, one, I want to know more about this uh, Class B vessel out of Newport. And two, I would like to know if NOAA is going to um, buy into the marine facilities planning software. So uh, that, just a quick correction on the first one. So it's going to be the, the, the Class A is going to be um, the one that's going to be in Newport. It'll be the um, discoverer. Uh, so we don't have names or really even a, a design fully accepted for Class B as of yet. So, um, and the marine facilities planning, we are shopping it. Um, we have our own system. It's the vessel um, planning. It's VPass. Um, we, you know, it it has its quirks, but it's certainly something that we've been used to and working with for a long time. And so we're kind of we're shopping the, the MFP program, planning on getting a pilot project together with the vendor to see if that's something that could work for NOAA as well. Okay, that would be great because uh, on occasion you use JSON or Sentry, so that would be good to kind of link into MFP so I could have the NOAA vessels uh, showing when those vehicles are being used. So for me, there's significance there. Thanks, Karen. Appreciate that. Other questions for Claire? Okay. Well, I, I think I my can... screen might have fro Yeah. Alice, you still here? I'm here. Okay, just checking. Yep. So that concludes our that concludes our planned presentations today. Um, uh, are there any lingering questions for any of our for any of our presenters from NSF, ONR, NOAA, and State Department? Um, with none, well, thank you for making time. To, thanks to our presenters, number one. Uh, a lot of good information today. I appreciate it. And thanks for all your efforts back in the uh, back within the Beltway. Um, to uh, take care of us and make all this possible. We couldn't do it without you. So thanks so much for uh, letting us know what's happening these days back that way. I think a lot of our folks don't understand the challenges you deal with in dealing with budget, you know, OMB and congressional staffers and everybody else in your own bureaucracies. So thanks for your, uh, your hard work each and every day. Uh, Wednesday, we're going to talk about facilities. Uh, we'll be on the same time, 1600 Eastern, uh, 1300 uh, Pacific, and we'll have updates on van pools, winch pools, uh, OBSIC, uh, the Marsam group, potential fields, uh, portable seismic system, and the MISO folks. So we have a lot of good stuff, a lot of good scientific stuff to talk about on Wednesday from people doing great work to, to really deliver the science. So we look forward to that. And with that, we'll say thanks so much and have a great afternoon. One, one quick one. I will be sending out a pre-meeting note before the next, um, either this afternoon or tomorrow morning. And so our focus for these facilities this year is going to be more on updates and changes from the previous year. And so if you want detailed descriptions like they had of their facility and such uh, and information, like you saw last year, um, or if people weren't here last year, you can go, uh, we will have links on that document to their last year's reports. So you will should you should be able to get that information there. And of course, you can always ask the facility operators for more information if you need it. Thanks, Alice. Yeah, very important. That, that'll, that'll really help set the stage for everybody and hopefully make it more of an update discussion rather than all the, de all the other details. So very good. Deb Bronk, do you have any last comments? All right. 
Okay. Well, thanks everybody. We'll see you Wednesday. Bye all. Bye bye.